In my morning time with God, I've been working my way through the book of Revelation, and this morning I was in Revelation 7, and uh, I hadn't really connected this song with that scripture until just as as we got about to the middle of it, I was like, wait a minute, I feel like I've heard some of that before. And uh, the middle of Revelation says, after this I saw a vast crowd too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings, and they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. He does reign above it all, friends. I know that sometimes as we look at the state of our world, uh, sometimes we doubt that victory, um, but this is what's happening. As we worshiped today, we were joining in heaven's worship where Jesus' rule and reign uh, is established. He is on his throne and he is not nervous. So I just want to begin our time in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth that we have sung, that you did send the darkness running out of an empty grave. Uh, We thank you that as the early church began to recognize just the incredible victory that you won on Easter Sunday, they, they switched everything. They reoriented their lives around your resurrection. They said, hey, we're not going to worship Friday and Saturday anymore. We are making a new day, the Lord's Day, Sunday to be our day of worship. Uh, They began to tell everyone everywhere about you, and they said, hey, we're serving a resurrected Jesus, a risen Messiah, a king who came in humility for us. Uh, Jesus, as they went, they endured all kinds of hardships and difficulties. As we uh, dive into your word today, we're going to read about uh, one incident of just extreme persecution, and yet Paul, after uh, getting stoned almost to death, uh, got up, brushed himself off, and went back into the city to continue to preach and teach about you before moving on to another community where you had not yet been named. And so, Jesus, I pray that as we dive into your word, that you would help us to see uh, what you would have for us, that you'd help us to hear what you would have for us. And, and mostly, Jesus, would you lift our eyes off of the, uh, the difficulties of today, uh, though they are real? Um, would you help us to see where you are in the midst of all that we face? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a very exciting day. We are diving into Acts 14, 8 to 20. We're going to see a miracle. We're going to see a misunderstanding. Uh, But before I dive into that, uh, I want to let you know that last month I attended the Western Canadian District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada's District Conference. And I know you're thinking, okay, well, what's the big deal about that? Let me explain it. Uh, So to give you some context, the Alliance is the denomination that this church is a part of. Our district is the Western Canadian District. It's comprised of over 120 churches in Alberta and one church in Yellowknife. And every two years, our district family and pastors and lay leaders gather together for a time of business and learning together. So this year, our keynote speaker was an Alliance Seminary professor named Dr. Stanley John, and he was talking about intercultural intelligence. As part of our time with Dr. Stanley John, we learned about the shifting nature of global Christianity and the implications for future missions. Uh, He shared how the church is growing rapidly in the global south and east, even as as it's declining in the global north and west. Uh, But the thing that he was saying that was really encouraging is it is growing far faster than it is declining. Uh, Within our lifetime, there will be countries that have more Christians present in them than all of Canada. Uh, Some of the fastest growing countries where uh, Christianity is thriving are in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and even in the Middle East. There is just an explosion of Christianity. And so we were encouraged, even as we were also reminded, hey, very quickly the nations will be coming to evangelize your neighbors. Because already, um, I mean, Canada's not even really in the top number of Christian sending nations. But that's mostly because we have a smaller population. Um, the U.S. is still the largest global sending country, but I think South Korea is third. 
And so fairly quickly, we are going to see the, the nations coming to Canada to bring Jesus back to us. We also talked about racism, and we were challenged to consider the narratives that we have believed about people. Uh, we talked about culture and how the gospel is preached in the context of culture and how it incarnates into the culture. We learned some very interesting things about culture. One thing that stood out to me is that culture is actually man-made, and as such, it reflects human creativity. Uh, and so in every culture, there are glimpses of the Imago Dei, the divine image. Uh, because humans are creative, we're created in the image of God, every culture will have sections, segments, where they, we can see that divine expression. Um, but just as humans are also marred by sin, that means that every culture is also marred by sin. And as we interact across cultures, we need to look for those redemptive analogies, those places where there is light in the culture, while at the same time challenging the depravity of culture, including pointing the finger at the depravity in our own culture. This is a time of great learning for me as someone who's considered cross-cultural work and who's taken some intercultural training. This was a very helpful time of learning about intercultural intelligence, and it helped me to see some of the biases and prejudice that were, prejudices that were inherent in my own understanding of faith. Now, why did I just tell you that, right? That's what you're all wondering. It's like, cool, thanks, Nathan. Like, you, you learned something for a day. Awesome. Thumbs up to you. Well, the reason why I'm bringing all this up to you today is because as we're continuing our series following the way, we're in Acts 14, 8 to 20, and we're going to see two things. Uh, first, we are going to see a miracle. Paul will take notice of a crippled man and will see the power of God to bring healing. But then we're going to see a cross-cultural misunderstanding. See, the community who witnesses this power, they didn't understand the source of the miracle. They thought that Paul and Barnabas were Greek gods come down to earth. And as I prepared the series, or the, the, the message today, as I was planning to figure out what we were going to talk about, my initial intention was to spend about half the time talking about the miracle, and the other half of the time talking about the cultural misunderstanding. Uh, but the more I worked on the miraculous, the less time I had for the misunderstanding. And so I realized if uh, the interaction of faith and culture interests you, if you are interested in intercultural intelligence, uh, if the misunderstanding is the part of the story you're most interested in, uh, then I would love to give you access to the recordings from District Conference. Then you too could learn about intercultural intelligence with Dr. Stanley John. And so if any of the intercultural intelligence stuff has been of interest to you, then let me know. Uh, for those of you online or for those of you with a sweet smartphone, uh, you can go to our website, centerpointchurch.ca. You can click on the, uh, contact, or the connect with us and under the service, uh, you can click on that and just fill in the little thing and it will, uh, the online service response, you can let us know that you want the intercultural intelligence videos. I'll send you the link. Uh, the videos will help you think honestly and theologically about the gospel in the global context, about culture, about, um, about communicating cross-culturally. It's very, very good. And again, we're not going to talk about it in the message, even though, well, I guess we're not going to talk about it very much. But if any of that interests you, let me know, and I'll hook you up. So having said all of that, having invited you to learn uh, from Dr. Stanley John about intercultural intelligence, what we're going to do now is dive into Acts 14, 8 to 20. So Acts 14, 8 to 20 says this. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes since he was the chief speaker. Now the temple of Zeus was located just outside the town. So the priests of the temple and the crowd brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We're merely human beings just like you. We've come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. 
In the past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. Isn't that an awesome story? And as I said earlier, there's two elements in the story. There's the miracle and there's the misunderstanding. Uh, the misunderstanding's pretty wild, and, and yet in some ways, it's an understandable misunderstanding. The people in Lystra were steeped in stories of God's walking among them, and so it would be very natural for them to see a clearly supernatural event like the healing of this man and ascribe that to the gods they knew. And Paul and Barnabas managed to convince them not to offer a sacrifice to them, but then the crowd turns on them, uh, spurred on by a group that had come from Iconium. And last week we learned that this group in Iconium had plans to kill Paul. And so that's why Paul and Barnabas had left to go on to Lystra. So this group, having not found Paul in Iconium, decided that they were going to travel to settle the score. They were going to go and find him and kill him. They attack Paul. I had a little bit of a laugh. We have no idea where Barnabas is in all of this. Um, but they attack Paul. They stone him. That is, they throw rocks at him until he is so beaten and bloody that they think he's dead. Then they drag him out of town to die. Then the believers in the area, they, they gather around him, and Paul gets up, he, you know, brushes the dust off himself, and he goes back into town, and then the next day, Paul and Barnabas head off to the next town to continue to preach Jesus. I mean, there is so much that we could say about the misunderstanding, we could talk about Paul's courage, we could talk about persecution, we could talk about loving enemies. I mean, Paul even comes back to both Lystra and Iconium at the end of this first missionary journey. Uh, there is a ton that we could say about the misunderstanding, but again, I want to rush ahead to the miracle. Uh, but just in case you think that a misunderstanding like this could only happen way in the distant past, I'm in the middle of reading this to you, and God brought to my mind uh, the story of the Richardsons who served in uh, what is now Papua New Guinea. This would have been in like the 60s or the 70s. Um, Don Richardson is teaching a group of people that have never heard about Jesus. He's figured out their language. He's telling them the story. He's reading them the Gospels, and he's telling them about Judas's betrayal. Now, what happens in your mind when you think of Judas's betrayal? I mean, we're shocked. We're a little bit angry. Well, when he told them about Judas's betrayal, this group cheered. Because in their culture, one of the highest virtues was to so befriend someone that when you betrayed them, they didn't see it coming. This culture valued fevery and deceit and lying, and they loved Judas. And so Don Richardson goes home to his wife, and he just says, oh my goodness, they don't get it. They think Judas is the hero in the Jesus story. And so he had to go and he had to spend a lot of time praying, a lot of time listening to their stories. He had to tear his own clothes and say, brothers, this isn't how it should be. That was just 50 years ago, friends. <laughs> so this kind of misunderstanding can happen all the time as we cross culture. Um, that's why building up that whole idea of intercultural intelligence is pretty key. Uh, but... What I do want to dive in is on the miracle and what it might mean for us as we look to live on mission for Jesus. So the guy who wrote Luke, the author, uh, or the guy who wrote the book of Acts is a doctor named Luke. Uh, he's on this journey. And what I love is that he gives us some very specific details to help us understand the scene. Uh, the text tells us that this man's feet were crippled from birth and so he never walked. Again, that's kind of a medical detail that a lot of us might miss. But the text tells us this, that this man was sitting, and he was listening intently to the teachings of Paul and Barnabas. And at some point in the message, Paul looked over, he looked intently at this man, and he discerned that this man had faith to be healed. And so Paul stopped what he was doing. He called out to the man in a loud voice, stand up, and the man jumped to his feet. Throughout the book of Acts, Luke tells us about a number of miraculous events. 
Through the ministry of Peter and Paul and Stephen and Philip and other members of the early church, we read about healings and about timely prophetic words. We read about dead people being brought back to life, and on at least one occasion, uh, someone who should have died from a snake bite is kept alive. We see blind eyes healed. We see people suffering demonic oppression set free. We see God provide divine direction. And there's two places where the Bible talks about unusual miracles. And there's something kind of hilarious about a miracle being unusual. It's like, oh, that's just the regular miracles. Uh, There's two places where the Bible talks about unusual miracles. Uh, At one point, God uses Peter's shadow to bring healing to people in Jerusalem. Wherever Peter is walking, sick people will line up beside the road so that his shadow might fall on them and they might be healed. Uh, And later on in Ephesus, uh, people will take Uh, napkins, aprons, and handkerchiefs that Paul has touched, they will take these items out to people, and God uses those to bring healing and freedom uh, to those in the community. And so miracles, the supernatural activity of God, it's actually common in the book of Acts. Paul speaking to a crippled man that stands up and is healed, it's not even the most dramatic miracle in the book. A lot of the times, Luke will just summarize, like we learned last week, and the Lord did, actually, let me read it officially. A lot of the times, what we find are these summary statements, and uh, so in Iconium, for example, uh, the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. Right? We have no idea what those signs and wonders were. We simply know that for a long time in Iconium, that's how these guys ministered. They ministered through preaching the word and through the miraculous. Now, I bring all of this up because how you read the book of Acts will strongly influence the lessons that we learn from a story like this. And so, if we read the book of Acts like a collection of hero stories, we're going to admire Peter, we're going to admire Paul, we're going to admire Barnabas. We will say good for them, good for God, we'll thank God, we'll worship, but at the end of the day, we'll go about our business. This book will be for us a history of God's work in the church and a reminder of what God used to do. But it's also possible for us to read the book of Acts not merely as a history of what God used to do in the church, but as an example of God's ministry activity in the world. It's possible to read the Gospels and to read Acts as a living example of God on mission. And if you do, then I suggest that this would help us live very differently. Because a person who sees God on mission and decides he's still in the business of moving supernaturally would live their life looking for where God is moving, alert for those that need a divine encounter. A person who sees Acts as an example of God's ministry activity would, like those in the book of Acts, be praying and fasting and looking for God to be giving strategy and guidance, alert for prophetic intervention. In short, how we read this passage in Acts matters. I mean, it's, it's positive both ways. If this is just history of the church, awesome. God's good. We worship. We celebrate. But if God still wants to work like this, then there are lessons that we could and should learn as those God invites to join him on mission. And so in my own spiritual journey, for most of my life, I've read Acts like a history and a hero narrative. I learned the stories, I knew the characters, and the history did have meaning. I mean, I admired Paul and Peter. I learned about their sufferings. I learned about their ministries. I was inspired by their faith and by their calling and by their commitment. But for the most part, I didn't believe that God was still in the business of doing miracles. I read the book of Acts to learn the history of the church and to celebrate what God has done. But I was not asking God, what do you want to do today? And the Sundays that would always blow my mind would be the Sundays when we would have uh, missionaries usually who were working in other countries, and they would begin to tell their stories of seeing supernatural activity. They would talk about healings or miraculous provision or words of knowledge. I remember uh, reading one story of a lady who, again, I mean, they're always in other countries where there's not a lot of stuff. Um, She was in a boat, and she desperately needed to make it back to their village uh, before nightfall. 
and they knew that they didn't have enough gas, but they knew that they needed to get back, and so they just started, and they drove this boat for like eight hours without it running out of gas, and they didn't have enough gas to get it to run, right? I mean, that's a miracle. That's something that you'd see in the Old Testament, like the widow of Zarephath and Elijah and Elisha, and it was happening, and I would hear those stories, and I would say, God is cool, but I would never say, like, I would shrug my shoulders, and I'd say, okay, I guess God still can do stuff like that, but I'd never wrestle with the harder question, if God still does miraculous things today, why am I not seeing and experiencing them? I would never actually stop and let the stories that I was hearing uh, challenge the theology that I'd come to believe to say, okay, does God still move the way that we see him move here in Acts 14? And if he wants to move that way, what am I going to do about it? Right? Like if God is still in the miracle business, if he can still do miraculous things, what am I going to do about it? Like, how should I respond? Those were the questions I'd never ask. On the Sunday, when the missionaries showed up, I would hear their cool stories. I would say, wow, God can do cool stuff. And then I'd go about my business, and I would kind of act like God was not actually in the miracle business. And that was my experience for much of my Christian life. I was content to read about supernatural activity, but I never really was doing the harder work of wrestling with what God might be saying to me about his activity in the world today. Have any of you had that experience? You read about it in Acts, you hear about it in missionary journals, and then you sort of go about your business? So over the last number of years, this has slowly been changing in me. Because as I mentioned earlier, our church is part of a denomination called the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. And historically, our denomination has believed that God is still doing supernatural activity in the world. Uh, the eighth point in our statement of faith is that divine healing is part of the atonement and it is available uh, and the church has access to healing, that God is still in the healing business. And so we should be anointing people with oil and praying for them. That's part of our historical belief. And over the last number of years, there's been a movement within our family of churches to rediscover the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. As pastors and churches are saying yes to the Spirit, they're seeing God move in many different ways, not just through healings, but through words of knowledge, through divine healing, through deliverance from demonic oppression, through acts of Spirit-inspired service. Uh, and so in my spiritual journey, as I read stories like here in Acts 14, I am moving from, this is a story about Paul to be celebrated and admired, to this is a story about God, about what he can and wants to do in the world. And as a denominational family, there are many other pastors and leaders on a similar journey of looking for Jesus to move in power, both in his church and in the world. Uh, one of our churches near Calgary, uh, they really jumped in on this, and I, I, this is a, a couple of years old, the stat, um, but they had 200 healings that they could basically say, we prayed for someone and they were made well. Some of it was like even like doctor verified where like they had the CT scan of cancer and then they had the CT scan that was, cl was clear. I mean, in one year, 200 people healed. Does that not sound a little bit like what we're reading in the book of Acts? And that's in a church less than three hours from here. And so God is in the business. And there's some other cool stories. I do want to share one other one just because um, I remembered it this morning. I didn't know where to put it exactly. I'm going to share it right now because it's super cool. I shared it with my group on Wednesday. Uh, so one of our Alliance seminary leaders, he had a friend who was a missionary again in Africa, uh, and he had collected a small group of people, and every Sunday they were holding a church service outside in the shade of a tree. Well, a witch doctor in the community was not happy about this church that was meeting and learning about Jesus, and so he came along and cursed the tree, and the tree died. Now, at this point, the missionary realized, okay, his church is going to disappear because they've just seen this demonstration of power, but he'd read the Bible, and he'd read the book of Acts, and he realized that God was in the business of doing amazing things, and he said, so he laid his hands on the tree, and he said, Jesus, heal the tree. And so the tree came back to life, and it's the only tree of its kind that bears fruit twice a year. It not only came back healthy, but it actually came back miraculous. It now bears fruit twice a year. 
right? Again, those are cool missionary stories. We hear them, we say, cool God. But what I'm challenging us to consider is, okay, if that can happen there, what might God be up to here? What might it look like for us to join him on mission? Now, there's still a lot of room for me to grow in this idea. Basically, I've come to the place where I'm no longer discounting those miraculous stories. I'm coming to the place where I'm celebrating what God is doing in other churches. What I would love to move towards is that place and space in my life where I say, okay, God, I want in. I want to play too, right? You're doing cool stuff in the world, in the community. You're doing cool stuff in Alberta. God, I want in. And my prayer for us is that we'll get to that same place where we say, hey, God, we want in too. We know that you can move. We know that you are moving. You are moving in cameras through your spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness and coming judgment. You are already having conversations. You are already speaking to the people that I'm about to interact with. And so, God, how might you be inviting me to join you on mission? And so with that in mind, as I look at this story, I see sort of three elements at work. There is a crippled man who is listening to Paul's teaching, And he comes to believe that Jesus could and wanted to make him well. It's said of this man that he has faith. And in January, we talked about faith. We defined faith as trusting in the person, power, promises, and presence of Jesus and following him in obedience. And so as this man listened to Paul share about Jesus, this man believed that Jesus was the answer to his problem. And the problem that that this man most seemed to want dealt with was his physical malady, and he believed that Jesus was the answer. And so this man hears about Jesus, he comes to believe, I need Jesus to move and heal my feet. And we see Paul, Paul's communicating good news. He's telling people about a God who loves them, who's died for them, who has the power to do amazing things, who can bring freedom from spiritual bondage, who can connect them with the love of the Father, who can bring hope to the hopeless, freedom to the prisoner, eternal abundant life, and even healing to physical bodies. And as Paul shares Jesus, the Spirit of God seems to have whispered to Paul, this man believes in Jesus and I want to heal him. And so Paul stopped what he was doing and he cried out, hey you, stand up. It's funny because that's the part of this that that kind of blows my mind away the most is that in the middle of Paul's preaching and teaching ministry, it's, it's kind of like the Spirit of God tapped him on the shoulder and then all of a sudden he's talking to these people but he's looking at that person and he says, hey, I, you, you, stand up. I wonder sometimes in my own life, am I even ready for God to do something like that? When I'm in my day-to-day, when I'm moving along, am I actually ready to be interruptible? And so Paul was. He cried out, stand up, and the man stood up. And I see God moving in the middle of the story, strengthening the man, giving him the courage to stand up, and the man stood up. God healed that person's malady. Now, we could talk more about healing specifically. Uh, We could preach a whole series on this, and and probably we should, um, because honestly, this is something that we need to grow more comfortable and confident in. We need to ask the hard questions. Uh, We need to wrestle through healing as a concept. But in Acts, there's lots of miraculous events, and and healing is just one part of the way that God demonstrates himself to those that he is calling to himself. I was thinking about this story, and again, that text from last week where we read about how God gave Paul and Barnabas the power to do miracles and supernatural things to demonstrate what they were saying was true. And so I took a step back. Uh, Initially, I'd zeroed right in on the healing, but the more that I kind of developed this, the more that I realized... um, the more that I start to think about this text, not in terms of what it says about healing, but as a way to think about how to join Jesus on mission uh, through spiritual gift evangelism. I, I, there's healing specifically happening, but I think all of us can take a step back and consider what might it look like to join Jesus in his mission by using the spiritual gifts that he's given us. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says that every follower of Jesus has been given a spiritual gift or a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That means that today, if you are a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has blessed you and gifted you with a spiritual gift for the common good, for the good of the church and for, uh, yeah, for the good of the church. 
Now, these spiritual gifts are listed. Prophecy, service, mercy, administration, teaching, words of knowledge, helps, healing. There's all kinds of spiritual gifts. There's lists in uh, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4, I believe. And as I was thinking about spiritual gifts, I realized that I think God wants to empower us to live on mission and point people to him by making use of the gifts that he's given us, not just in the church, but for the church in our homes, in our schools, in our community, and in our workplaces. And the more that I thought about sharing the good news of Jesus with others by living into and using the spiritual gifts that he's given us, the more examples that came to my mind of God partnering with his people through supernatural abilities to lead others to Jesus. Through the years, I've heard stories of God giving people words of knowledge to share with others to get people's attention and draw people to himself. Uh, One of the guys who uh, is the leader of the mentoring that I am doing, he's a guy named Chris, Uh, he loves to uh, evangelize, he loves to get out and share uh, God with people at malls, uh, at, at, at outdoor places and spaces, and one of the things that he's been leaning into in the last number of years is, is just letting God speak to him with words about the people that he's going to connect into, and one day he met an engineer And God gave him some specific things to say to this engineer. This engineer was not a Christian, didn't have an interest in being a Christian. This guy would have blown past him. But when God gave Chris these words to share with this guy, he stopped. And he said, okay, you know stuff that you're not supposed to know. And so I'm going to meet you here at the mall next week. And you can tell me me about this Jesus. Through words of knowledge, a spiritual gift listed in the Bible, uh, God used Chris and is using Chris to draw this man to Jesus. Through the years, I've heard stories of God using supernatural service to get people's attention, to draw people to himself. Uh, God has used teaching gifts to draw people's attention and draw people to himself. Friends, God is on a mission. He does not want anyone to perish, but desires that all would come to eternal life by hearing and believing in Jesus. And so, like I said, his spirit is at work right now in the world, speaking to people about sin and righteousness and coming judgment, and God is inviting you to join the conversation that he's already having with your neighbor, coworker, family member, or friend. Uh, One of the things that we've talked about is how because Jesus lives in you, you take Jesus places because Jesus is in you and you go to places, but, you know, technically speaking, he's already there. And so even though you're taking him with you, you're actually following him to the communities and places where he is already moving through his spirit. He has equipped you with gifts to join him on the mission, to join him in the conversation that he's already having. The big question for us is, are we actually abiding with Christ? Are we living in a real and vital relationship with him? Are we learning how he has equipped and gifted us? And are we ready to be interrupted by God when he wants, uh, with the people that he wants us to impact? Think about this story this way, right? Paul is serving in his gifts. He's following Jesus on mission. Jesus has commissioned him in Acts 13. Uh, He and Barnabas have gone out. They've got a pattern of ministry uh, that they're following. And so Paul is is doing what he's supposed to be doing by serving. Uh, He's serving in his gifts. Paul is a teacher. He's serving in his teaching gift. Paul also has a track record of being used by God to heal people. And so Paul's teaching. He's ready for a miracle. And as he is teaching... God helps him to see a man, a man who's been listening intently to the teaching and who's ready for an encounter with Jesus. Paul's serving in his gifts. God is using those gifts to bring healing to a man and to point people to Jesus. And God partners with Paul. Paul didn't have to do any of this on his own. We know that Paul didn't heal this man. Jesus healed this man. We don't have any of the specific details about how Paul knew that Jesus was about to do a miracle. But before he shouted, stand up, he knew that God was going to do the miracle. All Paul had to do was to live obedient to Jesus. He just had to do what God was leading him to do. And when you think of the story that way, it becomes kind of simple. This story isn't about the healing, though a healing occurs. This is the story of a God on mission 
and of a man who is abiding with Jesus. He's living on mission with Jesus and for Jesus. He's listening to the Spirit. He's serving in his gifts, and he's ready to be interrupted by God. And as Paul lives this kind of life, God draws people to himself through the miraculous. And in Paul's cases, there are lots and lots of miracles. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to the place where uh, my clothing will be used to bring healing to other people. I'm not sure if that's where it's going to be. But as I look at this, as I kind of break it down and step away from the hero narrative, this is about abiding in Jesus This is about living on mission with Jesus and for Jesus. This is about listening to his spirit, serving in the gifts that he's given, ready to be interrupted by God. Some of you might have a uh, a gift of hospitality, radical hospitality. When you open your home to people, when you open your life to people, people just are like instantly comforted. They were, they're calm. They're ready to share their story with you. God can use the gift of hospitality in your life to point people to himself as you are abiding in him. Some of you may have a teaching gift, and when you get up to teach people, whether it's one-on-one, whether it's in a small group, whether it's in a large group, uh, whether it's like Billy Graham speaking to hundreds of millions of people, but when you speak, God uses that teaching gift to point people to him. Some of you may have an administrative gift. I believe an administrative gift can be used to point people to Jesus. I don't have the gift of administration, but I know that God can even use the genealogies that are listed in Numbers and at the beginning of Matthew to point people to Him. And so some of you with a spiritual gift of administration can move in power in your workplaces and point people to Jesus if we're abiding with Him if we're living on mission with him, if we're listening to his spirit, if we're serving in our gifts, if we're ready to be interrupted by God. And so friends, are you abiding with Jesus? Are you living on mission with Jesus and for Jesus? Are you listening to his spirit? Are you serving in your gifts? Are you ready to be interrupted by God? One of the reasons why we've been pushing so hard over the last 15 months to get people to connect with Jesus and learn to abide through our Abide Discipleship uh, program is that it, it all begins there. Program's not even the right word for it. Uh, but John or Jesus tells us in John 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. As a pastor, it's a very humbling verse to read. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, Katie knows it. Our kids have been, have been walking their way through it as well. And so, friends, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We have no power. We have no magic. But as we learn to remain in him and his word remains in us, as we stay connected with him, the fruit happens. We see him move in people's lives. And so we want people to learn to abide. We want people then to grow in character. We want people to pray and fast and, and, and learn and are empowered by their gifts. And, and so we're on this journey together. And it begins in that relationship. It begins with that abiding. And as I look at Acts 14, 8 to 20, I mean, I see a miracle. I see a misunderstanding. But mostly what I see is I see Paul preaching about Jesus. He's serving in his gifts. He's ready to be interrupted by God. And so he steps out in obedience. And as Paul does, a man who's never walked a day in his life hears about Jesus, responds to Jesus, and stands up healed by Jesus. Friends, do you believe God is still in the miracle business? I believe that God can and wants to do supernatural things to draw people to himself. We see it in other countries, and we can see it here. There's some of us that have seen some cool stuff. Uh, Joan, I'm really glad that you're here. You've seen some cool stuff. Joan was telling me about a prayer meeting that her and her sister had that was part of a miracle that God used in keeping uh, some relatives who were in a boating accident alive. Uh, Over two hours they were swimming, and and God protected them. He preserved them. There's a whole pile of miracles. You can talk to Joan more about that. God is still in the supernatural business, friends. And if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then God has gifted you and he wants to empower you with supernatural gifts to serve in the church, but also to draw people to himself. And so if you have a gift of mercy or administration, there's a way for you to do that, to draw people to Jesus. 
If you have a gift of faith or teaching, there's a way for you to do that to draw people to Jesus. If you have the gift of prophecy or tongues, there's a way to do that to draw people to Jesus. Because none of these gifts are things that we really do apart from the empowering work of Jesus. And he is on a mission of telling people, of sharing people, of pointing people to himself. And so what we need is we need to be a people who are abiding with Jesus. We need to learn and be serving others with our gifts. We need to be listening to the Spirit. And we need to be ready to be interrupted by God when he tells us. And we need to be ready to step out in obedience. I mean, this whole idea of being interruptible, it's probably the biggest thing for us. A lot of the other things we can kind of get there, but the ability to actually slow down and say, God, I'm ready for you to hijack my day. I think that's a lot of the spaces where we get stuck, you know, because we got stuff to do, Jesus. And so if you can do it during the five minutes where I am driving from, you know, the bank to the grocery store, then I'm in. But to stop in the middle of the grocery store and actually pray with someone, I'm not sure if I, 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 I got to get the food on the grill because I got to get off to the next thing, right? That interruptibility, I think that is something that God really wants to speak to us specifically because uh, even in this COVID time, it's amazing how busy we can be. Friends, God wants to use you to point people to Jesus. We need to be ready to be interrupted by him. We need to be ready to step out in obedience. And then we trust him to do the miracles. We trust God for the fruit. We trust God to do what only he can do. And then if a crowd misunderstands you and thinks you're a Greek God and tries to kill you and leave you for dead, well, guess what? You get back up. You dust yourself off and you do it all again the next day. That's what we can learn from the Apostle Paul. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you today as the miracle worker, as the promise keeper, as the victorious one. We know, Jesus, that your word says that you are not slow about keeping your promise, as some people think, um, but your desire is that none should perish and all should come to eternal life. You have commissioned us as your church to bear witness to you, Jesus, to receive power. And then having received power, to bear witness for you in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Jesus, from, from Jerusalem, we're near the ends of the earth. And you've commissioned us as we are going to make disciples. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would uh, first help us to abide in you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. As we abide in you, Jesus, as we begin to see the world as you see the world, as we are going at work, at school, in our neighborhood, would you help us to see uh, those people that you want us to impact? Would you help us to see those places and spaces where you are already moving? And Jesus, would you help us to see how you've gifted us and how you might want to use the gifts that you've given us to uh, draw people to you? Jesus, would you help us to be interruptible, uh, that we would be ready to stop what we are doing and join you in what you are doing? Would we be ready to step out in obedience and then watch you work? Because Paul didn't do anything other than say to a man who was crippled, stand up. But Jesus, in that moment, you brought an incredible, miraculous event. And while the crowd did not understand what was happening, uh, even as we see Paul dragged off, there's a crowd around him. There is a family of believers from that community around him. They saw your miracles. They heard your message. They placed their faith and trust in you, Jesus. And a church was born in that community as people placed their faith and trust in you. And that's what we want to see, Jesus. We want to see your kingdom come. Your will be done. We want to see those people who are far from you uh, hear about you and come into fellowship with you. And Jesus, that's your heart as well. So teach us, I pray, uh, to bring your good news with us as we go and to join you on mission. Jesus, we just continue to sing about your, uh, about your victory as we continue to sing uh, about your work in the world. Would you call us uh, beyond our rational experience, would you call us to dive into what you want to do? Not into the explainable, but into the supernatural. 
A.W. Tozer said that if in the North American church, if the Holy Spirit was removed from us, 95% of what we were doing uh, would go on the same and no one would know the difference. But as we look at the early church, he said that uh, 95% of what they were doing would stop and everyone would know that you had left the building. And Jesus, we don't want that to be true anymore. Holy Spirit, would you come again, move in power in our midst. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.